everyone! So I am here to do a video I have been promising I will do for the longest time and I'm about to finally fulfill that promise. As you can already tell from the title of this video, I am going to be telling you all about my top 10 favourite myth retellings. So all of these books are specifically classical myth retellings that take a myth from ancient Greece or ancient Rome. Um, they often shared the same myths but um, with slight variations and different names and turns it into a piece of fiction for a modern audience. Some of these books are still set in antiquity so they um, take the original setting and they just go with the myth from that standpoint whereas others are much looser and perhaps bring the story and the themes to a modern setting and do something really interesting with it and I love them all that's why they're my top 10 favourite it. and I also feel like I was finally encouraged to really just like film this video because I'm having quite like the classical mythology week this week when I'm filming this I think the video you'll be seeing the week after is the same week that my book came out this is Greek myths meet the heroes gods and monsters of ancient Greece written by Jean Mingus who is myself and illustrated by the incredible Katie Ponder as I think you can already tell from the front cover the illustrations in this book are beautiful let me show you some of the inside but this is a children's book of Greek myths so it serves as an introduction to the topic of Greek mythology for children specifically around the ages of 7 to 11 but obviously a lot of that depends on the individual and it is non-fiction in terms of these are the original stories but I have written them in a way that is accessible to children in language that is accessible to children and hopefully I'm um, reasonably engaging as well it's published by DK Books and it also contains some fun facts about ancient Greece and Greek religion and Greek culture and what these myths meant to them but because they are Greek myths and even though I would call this non-fiction they're also stories so they work as um, stories and like engaging legends in that sense as well but yeah this came out this week and I'm having like a really weird like emotional moment to be honest and it all feels very surreal so I thought hey I'm gonna carry on this momentum of the Greek myth theme and talk about my favourite classical myth retellings. Like I said they aren't necessarily exclusively Greek retellings, they are Greek or Roman what I would call classical and without further ado let's just crack straight on. So I'm actually going to start by telling you about my favourite myth retellings that are still set in antiquity uh, of which there's six and then follow that up with the four which are slightly more modern, slightly more quirky. And the first book, these are in no particular order in regards to my favourites, I love them all equally, is Circe by Madeline Miller. <laughs> I think this is probably one of the most hyped, well-known Greek myth retellings on booktube if you don't count like Percy Jackson. Um, this is set in antiquity like I mentioned and it follows the goddess Circe. Now Circe is the daughter of a titan and the titans were the generation of gods that preceded the Olympians that are probably the most famous, they include Zeus, Hera etc etc. And she was not only a goddess but she was also a witch, she was a magic practitioner and she lived by herself on an island called Aea, isolated from the rest of civilization both humanity and deities and we follow her journey how she ended up on this island and then the hundreds of years that she spent there and the encounters she had whilst there because she's visited by famous ancient Greek heroes like Odysseus as well as gods like Hermes and occasionally leaves the island for one reason or another and this book does so many things incredibly first and foremost it is beautifully written Madeline Miller is a gorgeous writer she very much brings this topic to life She's also very like accurate to the original mythology. I feel like if you read this story, you're not going to be misled in terms of your understanding of Greek myths. Of course, she is giving Circe a character. Greek mythology doesn't necessarily like develop character. It doesn't necessarily give you a full idea of what that person's like. And she does that. She takes these stories about this woman and sort of tries to create a really well-formed, well-rounded character and she does that so well Cersei really really comes to life in that sense but all the incidents in the storyline are from Greek mythology and it shows you how Greek mythology weaves together most Greek and Roman myths are very interconnected a lot of the characters meet each other in different stories they're not completely separate and this shows that it's also I feel very readable regardless of whether you've read any 
original myths or not, and I would say that for all of these books, I do not think that you need to have read the original myths to appreciate and enjoy these books. I think they are written to be enjoyed by everybody, and knowing the myths before just adds an extra layer to that, or it might then be the encouragement you needed to, to read the myths afterwards. So that's completely fine either way. And I think Cersei gives you all the information that you need. And I think this book is about Cersei. It's a, it's a character story. Sure, there's plot, but it's about her and how wonderful and intriguing and complex she is as a woman and a goddess and actually explores a lot about humanity through the story of a goddess and her ties to those two worlds and her sort of situation in the middle. She exists in this, this sort of other space between the gods and the humans on her isolated island and I loved reading about her. I think she is absolutely fantastic as a character and I think this book very much brings to life Greek mythology and gives Circe her dues because often in the original myths she is a character that appears and intercedes in the story of great men but in fact she actually has a lot happen to her and we get to see it all from her perspective as it happens chronologically with these other heroes just like turning up now and then in the way that she usually turns up in their stories and I think that's really really clever. I will say there's actually three authors on this list <laughs> who I have interviewed for my podcast called That's Ancient History. I have a podcast all about antiquity and classical mythology, its um, history and its place in today's world. So Madeline Miller and her book Circe is one of those interviews. I'll try and remember to link all those episodes in the description box in case you're interested in hearing more about them. But the next book on this list takes place over a much shorter period of time and that is in large part because it is the story of a mortal and it is The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. Now this is a retelling of the Trojan War. The Trojan War is believed to be a real historical war but it's also a war that had a great many myths and legends and stories um, circling it in antiquity even. And in this story we follow one of the women who is a captive of the Greeks. So the Trojan War is a war between the Trojans and the Greeks known as the Achaeans and we follow Briseis who is a Trojan princess that is the captive of the Greek hero Achilles. And what this book does incredibly well is really demonstrates the effect of war on women. It's not just a fiction piece. This book is very much rooted in the real experience of women in war zones both in antiquity but throughout time and up until the modern world and I know Pat Barker the author did a lot a lot of research. She writes a lot of wartime literature and she often explores the effects of war on the psyche and the trauma of war and perhaps looks at the effects of war on those that we don't usually associate with it um, and, not all, and who aren't always soldiers for example and in this instance during the Trojan War as was common amongst most ancient warfare the uh, women of the civilizations that were warring against one another were captive when their different cities were taken and basically turned into sex slaves. They were enslaved because slavery was um, a part of these societies and used sexually. They, their, their consent was negligible in the eyes of the soldiers even if it obviously wouldn't have been to them. And we explore the effects of the Trojan War on this woman Briseis as she um, is essentially, like I mentioned before, taken into sexual slavery by the soldiers and by men that are hearkened back to constantly as heroes. We see them as heroes who win battles and fight wars and uh, take the central role of so many myths but what were they doing to these women? And yes, these are mythological characters, but they are things that really happened. So I thought that was incredible. And I think this is a really emotional book. I would not say it's a particularly cheerful book, but it's such an important book. And I feel like it's an excellent example of how myth retellings in themselves can almost be works of academia because it explores and introduces us to topics that maybe haven't had the same deal of attention from scholars themselves, but with a lot of research can be brought to life and highlighted by creative writers. And I love this book. And I have also interviewed this author on my podcast. So whilst we're 
on that train, I will mention the last book on this list that is by an author who I've interviewed on my podcast, and it's also a retelling of the Trojan War. It is A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes. Natalie Haynes is another incredible writer, and this is not her only Greek myth retelling. She has a real penchant for retelling Greek myths and exploring Greek mythology, and she does it really, really well. But what I find particularly amazing about One Thousand Ships is the vast array of voices that we hear from. from. It's another one that goes back to the Trojan War and gives a female perspective on the events of that war. But it's not just about one woman, it's not just about one woman's experience of the war, it's trying to really bring together all of the different women's voices of the Trojan War and their experiences. So we have goddesses that somehow played a role in this war, we have demigoddesses, we have nymphs, we have muses, and then we have the mortals as well. We have the Greek mortals, we have the Trojan mortals, we have mortals who are enslaved, we have mortals who um, are not even in the war zone but are at home waiting for their husbands to return, like Penelope, and all of their voices coming together. And you might think that that would be too much, like that would be too many voices in one space that you need to focus in on one. But somehow Natalie Haynes manages to get the balance perfectly. Somehow Natalie Haynes manages to introduce you to a book full of so many women, so many voices of a very dramatic, tragic event in history and in mythology and make them all come to life make them all feel like individuals and some of them get a few pages because they're women that really we don't know much about that had brief references in the ancient sources and then others get multiple chapters because they're women that we hear a great deal about in the ancient material and that's something else that Natalie Haynes does really well you can tell how much research she puts into her book she is clearly so familiar with the ancient material and everything she draws on is from that ancient material and just sort of creating a accessible way for modern audiences to to experience that for potentially the first time or just get new perspectives on stuff they might have already read and it's so well done. So the next book on my list actually has a very very special place in my heart because it was an incredibly formative read for me and that is The Penelope Ad by Margaret Atwood. So this is the only book on this list, no not the only book on this list that I've reread but I have one of two that I've reread in the past and I've read this book three times now. I first read it when I was around 15 or 16 when my dad bought it for me because I had an interest in Greek mythology and it's a retelling of again events of the Trojan War but not exactly. <laughs> if you're familiar with ancient literature you'll know that the poet Homer wrote two big works that have survived called the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Odyssey takes place after the events of the Trojan War and we follow one of the Greek soldiers Odysseus on his journey home and he continuously gets waylaid and it ends up taking him like another 10 years to get back home and meanwhile his wife Penelope is at home waiting for him, having to um, sort of stave off suitors who want her to accept that her husband is dead and to marry them instead so she can, they can have her land. And in the Penelope ad, we follow Penelope's story from Penelope's perspective. So in this book, we sit with Penelope waiting in Ithaca for Odysseus to return and what it is like for her being faced constantly daily by these suitors trying to pressure her to marry them, trying to decide whether Odysseus will ever come back or not, trying to raise their son who barely knows his father who's been away for decades. And Penelope is actually quite well known from Greek mythology as one of the most cunning clever women as is Odysseus. They are quite a cunning duo and she comes up with some incredible plans to sort of stave off these suitors and then like keep them away from her for as long as she can but at the same time they're also eating her out of house and home and setting up camp basically in her palace and it's a stressful situation and this book was the first time I actually learned this myth fully. I'd never read The Odyssey before I read this book and it was so interesting being introduced to it from someone who isn't necessarily the central character of the original, although we do follow Penelope's story in that as well. And it's so clever because it also manages to combine different facets of Greek literature. We have um, different chapters in this book which are written as sort of choral odes. They are performed by choruses which were a common, if, if not required, feature of ancient Greek tragic 
plays, there was always a chorus in plays who would deliver certain parts of the story. And in this, this book, we also get a chorus which is from the perspective of the um, slave women, the slave women who worked in uh, Penelope and Odysseus's palace and were killed when Odysseus returned home. And you always know this because you always know they're telling you about their perspective as well. And that's a slightly different perspective on the story and I thought that was a really interesting like a balance between these different women and their different experiences and their different places in society and the hierarchy and the different ways they are used by men and able and attempt to adapt to their situation and make the best of it and it's so interesting and so clever and I think it gives a really interesting perspective on the story of Odysseus and on Penelope as a character and does what again I think is so interesting about myth retellings is sort of bring them to life and make you think about them in a new way and for that reason I absolutely love it. I just think it's beautifully written as most of Margaret Atwood's books are. She has a way with prose and like I said it had a very formative impact on me as a reader because um, I never studied classics or ancient history at school. I very much got into it recreationally and then went on to study at university and I feel like the Penelope had played a role in that when I was a teenager so that was kind of epic. <laughs> we then have the last book set entirely in antiquity because actually I realised the next one I was going to mention is more of like a um, bridge <laughs> between antiquity and the modern days and that is Hear the World Entire by Anne Wynne Hayward. So this one's a novella, it's shorter than um, the ones I've mentioned so far although actually Mark Atwood's Penelope ad is quite short as well but for a short book there is a lot of impact and I love that. I love when somebody writes a really impactful novella and in fact I feel like in a short space you can do something really interesting that you can't always do in a longer format. And this book follows the story of Medusa who is somebody I want desperately to read more retellings of, more like feminist retellings of because Medusa has done so much injustice in our memories of her. She is the Gorgon most well known for these snakes in her hair that can turn humans to stone by looking at them. However, in the original myths, Medusa began life in most versions as a mortal woman who was raped by the god Poseidon in a temple of Athena and Athena was so angry that her temple had been desecrated that she punished Medusa for her rape and turned her into a gorgon. And then Athena sets a hero on Medusa to have her slayed who is Perseus and it's so tragic and it makes me so angry and it makes me so angry that we usually remember Medusa as a monster and that so often in popular culture she's portrayed as a monster that really really distresses me but not in this book. This book is incredible. This is Medusa's story. This is Medusa's perspective on what's happened to her. It is set in a period of her life where she has been turned into a gorgon post the incident of her sexual assault when she first meets Perseus. But her introduction to Perseus is not what you expect. He is this mortal hero who comes to visit her and they, they build a rapport. They start communicating with one another because Medusa has hidden herself away from mortals in this cave in order to prevent herself from turning them to stone and from harming them because she doesn't want to. And therefore she's become entirely isolated and Perseus is the first person that she's really able to communicate with since all of this happened and in that way it very much explores the real experiences of um, those who have suffered through sexual violence and it explores the silencing of women, the way that um, those who have experienced sexual violence can be isolated literally and emotionally and the trauma that they go through and it, it does that through an ancient myth and I think it's such a clever clever story and so so well written and I'm really hoping that Anwen will have more Greek myths retellings in the future that I can um, read and I'm now just realising that I have also interviewed Anwen on my podcast. I clearly have no idea what's going on. Anwen is also a PhD student so we talk a little bit about her research but it, we do also talk about her book so I will link all four of those interviews in the description box down below. <laughs> Then I mentioned that I sort of had a bridging book and that is Wait by Jeanette Winterson. So Jeanette Winterson is one of my all-time favourite authors of all time. She is phenomenal and I think this is probably the second myth retelling I read after the Penelope ad. It's from a series that Canongate published with different authors retelling different myths and folk tales, not exclusively Greek and Roman um, but including Greek and Roman. And Wait is the story of Atlas. 
So Atlas was a Titan who sided with the Titans during uh, the Titanomachy, which was the war between the Titans and the Olympian gods for rule of the universe. And the Olympians win. So the Titans that fought against them are punished and Atlas is punished to hold up the weight of the world on his shoulders for the rest of time. But he does crop up in myths later on in um, sort of the chronology of Greek mythology, including those involving Heracles. And we follow Atlas from sort of the point in his life before this happens, before he is punished and set to hold up the weight of the world on his shoulders. And then what happens during that time? What happens whilst he is holding that up? What happens when he meets Heracles, makes a deal with Heracles and becomes a part of other Greek myths? But because it takes on this quite like surreal scenario in which there is a titan holding up the earth and holding up the way of the earth so that the sky doesn't all fall down on us, um, Jeanette Winterson takes it further and goes beyond the original myths and brings it in to the modern world where Atlas becomes this quiet observer of everything going on around him and he's still here metaphorically today holding up the world and and that I thought was so interesting. I love that concept. Atlas felt like such a real character and I love the way that Jeanette Winterson had him still here, still alive, still watching in the 21st century. I thought that was incredible. And like always, Jeanette Winterson's prose are just stunning. She is one of the most elegant, magical writers I've ever read. I love most of the things that she writes and we is one of my favourite. I think it's just a gorgeous piece of literature and like I said I'm just like a big Jeanette Winterson fan but I also think this one's very clever because I've never really read the Greek myth retelling like it. I've certainly never read any other Greek myth retellings about Atlas and I also really like the depiction of Heracles in it. I feel like Heracles in weight is the Heracles I picture having read the ancient material that is Heracles to me. So I thought she did a really good job of characterising him as well and it's not the Disney version. <laughs> so next we actually have the one book in this video that is a collection of poetry. Yes, I have a poetry collection that retells Greek mythology but I couldn't not include it because it would be a lie to say it's not one of my favourites and this is one of the other ones I've reread in the past and I've reread it cover to cover and I've also just reread individual poems in it but it is Hold Your Own by Kate Tempest. So like I said this is a collection of poetry but it starts off with one long poem in the sort of epic style of an ancient poem because epic poetry was very popular antiquity, big long poems that told Greek myths and stories in, in like a very in-depth format. And at the beginning of this collection you get the big long poem which is all about Tiresias. So in mythology Tiresias was a prophet who was asked by Hera to um, decide on an argument between herself and Zeus. So Hera was the queen of the gods and married to Zeus. And they were having an argument about um, whether men or women enjoy sex more. And they asked Tiresias to settle this argument for them and it doesn't go in Hera's favour so she ends up punishing him by blinding him. And then because Zeus can't undo another god's powers, he can't unblind Tiresias, he gives him in exchange for his blindness the, the power of prophecy and the power to see the future. But the reason that they asked Tiresias is because of something that happened to him before all this, before he becomes a seer. Tiresias is an ordinary man just walking through the forest one day when he finds two snakes coupling and he breaks the snakes apart and he in that moment is turned into a woman and suddenly becomes she and lives her life for many years as a woman until a similar incident happens many years later and she becomes he again. So Tiresias has lived his life as both a man and a woman and that's why they feel like he can answer that question for them. And what is so incredible is about this collection is that first up the big long poem at the beginning which is a muddle of antiquity and modern day tells the story of Tiresias and his experience of being a man and of her experience of being a woman, of interacting with the gods about the punishment and the gruesome gory details of what happens to them at the hands of the gods. But once you've read that big long poem, which you can also see Kate Tempest perform 
by like heart on YouTube in videos which I think is incredible and I'll try and find one of those link it down below and we then have four sections of poetry following on from that so we have um, I think girlhood boyhood manhood and womanhood or something along those line in terms of themes and we have individual shorter poems some a page long some four pages long under all those different topics so it's also exploring gender and sexuality and fluidity through these poems and through this myth and going from retelling that myth to then drawing on the themes in the rest of the poems and I think it is splendid, incredible, beautiful, magical, powerful and just one of my favourite poetry collections of all time and I really feel like a beautiful homage to Greek mythology but for a modern audience so I love it. I then have three more books all of which are novels but set in the modern world and inspired by Greek or Roman mythology. So first up is a YA novel named Orpheus Girl by Bryony Rebel Henry. And I say inspired because in some respects this is a retelling, but in other respects it is a really creative, interesting way of using mythology to create a new story and to draw on those themes and to draw parallels and just like I said, do something really creative. And I love this story. It's another one that's very heart hitting, very emotional. It's not like laughter, joy at every turn of the page because it's about two teenage girls who are in love with one another but still live in a town in the US which is very, very reluctant to embrace um, members of the LGBTQ plus community and therefore they are sent when they are discovered to a conversion camp society to be turned straight. And that is just automatically going to be a hard topic to read about because it does not shy away from the realities that are still faced by many, many LGBTQ plus kids and adults in the modern world who are sent to places like this and they are often emotionally and sometimes physically tortured to not be themselves. They are told that they are wrong and punished for their, their sexuality or their gender identity and it's so hard to read about but it's such an important topic to know about because like I said this is still something that actually exists. And it's inspired by the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice in the way that in the original story, Orpheus and Eurydice are a couple, a man and a woman, who fall in love and are married. Um, however, Eurydice one day goes into the forest, where all the bad things happen, obviously, <laughs> and dies. Um, she's bitten by a snake and she dies and goes down into the underworld. Now, Orpheus is the most beautiful musician out there and he sort of plays all these gorgeous, beautiful, sad, lamentable songs until the gods feel sorry for him. And they offer him the opportunity to travel down into the underworld and um, bargain with Hades, king of the underworld, to bring Eurydice back into the world of the living. So he does this and Hades says that you can have Eurydice back if you leave the underworld now trusting that I will send Eurydice to follow behind you. I will send Eurydice to follow you out of the underworld but you cannot turn back. Now of course as these tragic stories go Orpheus is right at the end, right about to exit the underworld when he loses faith, turns around to look for Eurydice and there she is, he can see her behind him but because he's looked back she immediately disappears and vanishes returning to the underworld. We have the story of two lovers, one of whom attempts to rescue the other from a dark place and in that sense this is the premise of our story in Orpheus Girl where one of the girls pictures herself as Orpheus. Uh, there to save her girlfriend and herself and to save their relationship. But it doesn't necessarily exactly follow all the events of the myth. What it does is it takes a character who's actually a big fan of Greek mythology, her mother, who she doesn't have a relationship with, who left as a baby, was an actress that played Helen of Troy in a TV adaptation and she's always been fascinated by Greek mythology because of this and she relates her own story to Orpheus and Eurydice and like I says, paints herself as Orpheus and paints her girlfriend as Eurydice and really it's a way for her to explore her own emotions, her own feelings, her own experiences through these stories that she can talk about in a way that she can't talk about her own feelings because she is being told to repress herself, she's being told that she is wrong, she is being beaten down, like I said, physically and mentally and cannot really like voice her own 
experience but she can look at these Greek myths and she can draw parallels and she's able to explore these feelings and emotions through them and articulate them and I really love that and I also thought like I said explored a very important topic um, but did something really creative with the original myths and it doesn't just draw on Orpheus and Eurydice like I also mentioned there's references to Helen of Troy we also have references to the myth of Sisyphus for example and I thought all of that was really 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 clever. We then have Home Fire by Camilla Shamsey which I will again describe as clever. I just think there's something so clever about modern retellings of ancient myths when somebody takes an ancient story and does something incredibly clever to create a piece of modern literature that can be read by a modern audience who doesn't need to know the myth but then also has all of these like almost um, secret hidden meanings and extra layers for those that might know the myth or might learn about the myth after and you can do that either way round. And Home Fire is a retelling or inspired by the story of Antigone. So in Greek mythology, Antigone is a young woman whose brothers both die, but her brother is not allowed a proper burial because her uncle, who is now the king, has painted her brother as a sort of criminal and therefore won't give him a proper burial. And she refuses to go along with this and gives her brother an illegal burial. But they also have quite a tragic, sad past that has um, changed everyone's uh, perspective on her and her brothers and sisters because in the myth it turns out that her parents were actually mother and son so they are the product of an incestuous relationship that nobody knew about until after the fact including her mother and father who were Oedipus and Jocasta. Now in the story in Home Fire it's not um, the tale of children born of incest but it takes that story of a family where something happened that has um, changed everybody else's perspective of them that has um, given them this image to the public that they they didn't foresee and had no control over. But in this instance we follow two sisters and a brother in the modern world whose father that they don't have any contact with now turned out to be a terrorist or part of a terrorist organisation and that has obviously um, sort of put a dark shadow over their entire family and then the brother himself goes away supposedly to also join this organisation and it's about the relationship between those um, three young people, about their family history, about their relationship with their different cultures and meshing those together. It's incredibly beautiful, again a little bit harrowing because it is based on quite a tragic myth and like I said just very very clever. It's taken the themes of the Antigone story and the Oedipus and Jocasta story about family and culture and duty and loyalty and love and taken them and put them in a very modern scenario, in a, in a very modern story and it's just very very well done. Then last but not least we have The Vegetarian by Han Kang and I saved this one for last because I don't think a lot of people realise that it is actually based in or inspired by a Roman myth. It is inspired by a myth that you can read in Ovid's Metamorphosis or it at least draws on themes from this myth and that is the story of Daphne and Apollo. So Daphne was a young woman that Apollo developed a desire for and the gods don't take no for an answer so he attempts to rape her, he chases her through the forest and um, because she denies him and does not want to have sex with him but he keeps going and in order to escape him she begs the gods to turn her into a tree and therefore she becomes a tree rather than be raped by this god. That is the story of Daphne and Apollo and if you've read The Vegetarian you might already be able to notice sort of parallels there with the story. The Vegetarian is a book that very much is its own thing, like it is not a straightforward myth retelling, it is a lot more than a myth retelling but it still has those parallels, it still draws on those themes and it still has little embedded references to that story and it's very interesting when you consider the two as um, as connected. Now The Vegetarian is one of my favourite novels, it's a piece of South Korean literature about a young woman who decides to become a vegetarian but her decision to become a vegetarian is tied up in, in so much more. It is very much tied up in her relationship with men and the control men try to exercise on her so she doesn't have as much independence as she would like when she decides to become a vegetarian, her husband objects to it, her father tries to force feed her and she's in quite a loveless marriage to begin with where she's not really treated like an individual but is rather like a maid that exists in his household. 
and each chapter of the three chapters is told from a different perspective, none of which are hers, so we never directly hear her voice until a few snippets near the end. And in chapter one, we hear from her husband. In chapter two, we hear from her sister's husband, who becomes obsessed with her sexually. And then in chapter free we hear from her sister and it is all about this woman desperately trying to gain control over her own body in what turns into a steady descent into madness I guess you could describe it because of the treatment that she faces and the way that her body is used and taken from her and that's where it draws parallels with Daphne and Apollo and there's also references to trees and flowers and nature and the parallels become clearer and clearer as you read the story. But like I said, the theme is very much about a woman desperately wanting control over her own body, which I think is a sadly very timeless theme because it's something that women still face on a regular basis. And society feels like it owns women's bodies and that it should have a say in women's bodies. And um, that dynamic and the like pain and tragedy of that. And it's incredible. It is so beautifully written. Han Kang is a stunning writer. Now I read this in translation, so the translator also did a phenomenal job to bring that, that beauty to English for me as an English reader. And I just love this book. It's one I actually really need to go back and reread. And I didn't know myself was rooted in the myth of Daphne and Chloe until after I'd read it. I didn't know that going in at all, but I think it's really, really interesting when you learn more about it. And also that Han Kang, the author, has um, a, a background in classics. So it's clearly very familiar with these stories. But those are my top 10 Greek and Roman classical myth retellings. I love these books. I'd highly recommend all of these books. Obviously, I've focused on classical myth retellings here because that's what I've read the most of and I am a classicist and an ancient historian myself. But I love myth retellings of any culture and I'm definitely trying to read more from other cultures. So when you leave your recommendations, which I'm hoping you will do, don't just let me know about your favourite Greek and Roman myth retellings. Also let me know about retellings from other folklore, fairy tale and uh, mythological traditions. I'd love, love, love to hear about them, whether they be for children, young adults, adults, whether they be poetry, whether they be fiction, whether they be set in antiquity or in modern day. Let me know. I'd also love to hear from you if you've read any of these books, what you thought of them as a reader, did you come to them familiar with the myths or not? please let me know. I will also, like I mentioned, like any of the resources that I have discussed in this video about antiquity that might be of help to you, just anything classics related, because I know um, there's a real subsection of my audience that are super into that stuff, just like I am, and I'm here for it. So yeah, thank you for watching. Until next time, happy reading, and I'll see you all again soon. Bye, everyone.